Hi, my name is Harris. I'm one of your podcast hosts. I'm also a lawyer at Treadstone Law. For most Canadians buying, selling, or refinancing real estate, a lawyer is the last thing on their mind. That's unfortunate because lawyers play a vital role in the process. But what choices do Canadians have? Lawyers can be very expensive. Well, Treadstone Law offers resources to Canadians so they have access to the information they need. Whether you sign up for a live workshop or a mailing list, we cover topics to help you make informed decisions and avoid costly mistakes. It's advice you can start using today, and best of all, it's free. Visit treadstonelaw.ca forward slash MAS offer or click the link below to get access right now. If you're looking to retain Treadstone Law, it's never been easier. Our entire process is online. From completing the retainer agreement to your signing appointment, everything is done from the comfort of your own home. We're your digital lawyers. The best part of it is that you don't pay anything when you're retaining our firm. Visit treadstonelaw.ca forward slash MAS offer or click on the link below to retain us right now. Enjoy the podcast. Welcome to another episode of Hustle and Grit. Today on the podcast, I have Hashim Abul Hosan. Um, Hashim is a co-founder and president of Rocket Mortgage Canada. Rocket Mortgage recently announced its entrance into Canada with the rebranding of Windsor-based mortgage brokerage Edison Financial. Rocket Mortgage is the largest, largest mortgage lender in the United States and by that fact, the world. Um, Edison Financial, on the other hand, started in 2019 and grew from a team of four to more than 170 less than, in less than three years. That's a lot of success. Welcome to the podcast, Hashim. Thank you, Harris. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Awesome. You know what? I was going through um, a bit of your history, and you've got a very storied and impressive history. Um, and whether, whether you're in private equity, you've jumped into Canadian tech, um, you've been senior executive at Lendesk, uh, for those listeners who don't know what Lendesk is, Lendesk is a, t- a Canadian technology firm, it's safe to say it is oriented around um, providing um, automation to the mortgage side of things. And then you started, um, and I'm, I'm really just making this succinct because you've got a very good history. And then you kind of started uh, Edison Financial, which has recently turned into Rock and Mortgage. Can you give our listeners just kind of a walkthrough as to what your journey was and how you ended up with Edison Financial, how you got there, and what really kind of got you to start um, a mortgage brokerage? Sure, yeah. Um, and actually, funny side note, I actually listened to your podcast with Greg Williamson at Lendesk. I thought that was quite good. So, um yeah. So in terms of my particular story, um, my career started in capital markets, as you said, with RBC Capital Markets, first in Toronto and then in the UK. From there, I moved into venture capital. That's what first got me uh, into the startup space with a firm in Vancouver called Vantage. Um, from there, I started to really get the itch to maybe start my own business. And I ended up um, partnering with a guy by the name of Alex and Coney. And he, at the time, had a vision to create essentially a family investment office, um, which later became Kokoni Growth Partners. I co-founded that with him. And he had previously started a small uh, private mortgage lender, um, which at the time was called Alt Mortgages. And, you know, there was seven million of assets at the time, one and a half uh, team members. And um, he asked me to basically take a look at it. And it was, a, it was a very interesting time in the mortgage space. It was late 2014, early 2015. And. For those that um, remember, it's really around the time that I think a lot of real estate, first in Vancouver and later in Ontario, and later, of course, elsewhere in Canada, really started to take off. And the private mortgage space was still relatively nascent at the time. Um, A lot of individual operators, not necessarily a lot of uh, more uh, larger scale or more sophisticated players. And... I think we saw an opportunity there to really bring a new level of sophistication around the space. So, you know, everything from the way that we sourced capital, the way that we managed risk, the way that we uh, um, sourced deal flow, and all this while, Alex was building a company called Lendus Technologies, which, as you mentioned, I ended up at later. But my start really started off in that private mortgage space, applying that previous experience around uh, around figuring out how to build a, a lender at the time. 
So why, why did you go from being a lender to the technology? Because those are two very kind of different sides. I wouldn't say the same coin, but they're different aspects of yeah. the same industry. Agreed. And, and you know, I think in, in many of our businesses, I mean, your, your background is as a, is as a lawyer um, and here you are also in the technology space. I think many businesses are essentially needing to become some kind of a tech business uh, in order to really mm -hmm. be competitive uh, where we're at today. So a big part of our focus at neighborhood at the time was thinking about how do we apply technology to make our business better from again, risk management, client experience, broker experience and Lendesk, was one of the leading players in that space, um, was really on the ground floor in terms of understanding the emergence of new technologies, the needs of mortgage brokers, the needs of lenders. And um, and so it was a, you know, having sort of watched the growth and success of that business, um, what ultimately actually culminated in my making the move was conversations that started between Lendesk and uh, at the time Quicken Loans. And Alice asked me to join uh, which I did in the fall of 2018, handed the reins of neighborhood over to another partner of ours, Taylor Little, and uh, and I joined Alex at Lendesk. Um, and um, and I think that my journey has been interesting in the mortgage space and really even outside the mortgage space is now, you know, it's been almost eight years. I've seen things from the lending side. I've seen things from the technology side. I've seen things from the brokerage side. And all of that, I think, gives me a, helps me understand a complete picture of the clients, the brokers, the partners, all of which really comes into play in this, you know, very complex, very competitive, very dynamic space. I think I think that uh, earlier on, and I know we've just been recently introduced, but earlier on with our firm, um, one of the reasons that. Um, even with Treadstone, we kind of moved more into technology we, was we saw exactly what you're saying. Like there's just a lot of players and there isn't a lot of good software out there that brings everybody together to make a good solution to make this entire transaction flow and everybody to have conversations with one, one another to just have a seamless kind of customer journey, which is what kind of our focus is. And by Rocket Mortgage, yeah. what I know of in the U.S., and I'm, I'm attributing that to Canada as well, it's definitely your focus, where it's the customer journey. It's like what Warren Buffett says, that like you got to wake up in the morning and first thing you're thinking about is, how do I delight my customers? It's not about the bottom line. It's how do you delight your customers? Yeah. So yeah. No, with I mean, that... Yep. Absolutely. Sorry, I cut you off. No, I was, I was, just, I was just agreeing with you. I'm a big fan of... Uh, big fan of Warren Buffett's and, and I think that statement in particular. Yeah. So, I mean, so then I guess you went from Lendesk back into, uh, to the mortgage side, which is Edison financial and kind of looking at or hearing you speak, it's, it seems like, you know what it, after that, it's kind of a natural kind of jump in. If you know, kind of the entire customer journey, um, it's kind of an easy kind of move to move back into the brokerage brokerage industry. Can you talk a little bit about, um, one of the biggest questions I have, okay, is uh, you set, um, you started off Edison Financial uh, seeking funding, and you raised capital, um, and there's very, very, very few firms within the Canadian market that have done that. What made you decide to seek capital, to seek investors, when I say seek capital, seek investors from day one? So the way that, um, the way that, you know, this version of Edison came about because there was a previous instance of Edison that, you know, uh, that um, that I had started uh, with that, with that, you know, with Alex and Taylor back in 2017. We ended up sunsetting it or putting it on hold when I went over to uh, hmm. to Lendesk. But when we decided to resurrect it, what, you know, one of the things that prompted it is being at Lendesk. Um, I've got to observe uh, really the way in which the industry was changing, the which client mm -hmm. preferences were changing, um, some of the opportunities and challenges that, that brokers were facing because, you know, Lendesk as a service really serves essentially brokers and lenders together. And um, there was a fortuitous meeting with a man by the name of Chad, Chad Weinbaum. He was a 20-year veteran of, of uh, Quicken Loans, now Rocket Companies, where he had observed really the tremendous growth in that business, the way in which it evolved and adapted and went from, you know, a, a small regional player to the number one mortgage lender in the United States, you know, in the span of uh, 20 years. I mean, 
rock company has been around for 30, but really the, the, I think the last 20 years I feel was really the most tremendous growth. So Chad made a comment that he, um, he, he noticed a lot of similarities between Canada at that time and the, with the way the U S market operated maybe 10 years ago. And so we started talking about what, what it might look like to take essentially the best of Lendesk, the technology that had been created and that vision of the future and the best of uh, rocket in terms of culture, uh, sales strategy, marketing, uh, and its own technology and, and combining those two things to create a, a direct to consumer offering in Canada. And that really was the genesis of that conversation. So Chad and I essentially um, started working on that idea with the help of others. And we were fortunate enough early on to get the backing of uh, Rocket Rockets board as as a backer. So hmm. um, in, in many ways, it was a um, it was we were fortunate to have the right people in the room from the get go to get that support, get that buy in yeah. and have a backer like like Rocket, which, you know, having been in venture for a while, in some ways they are the uh, in some ways they're the, the best kind of backer in some ways they are the worst kind of backer because they know what a good mortgage business looks like very high standards, but also, yeah. also, uh, an incredible, yeah. uh, vision for, uh, you know, what success looks like. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's also, and, and you, you being in the capital markets, you probably know this better than I do, but there's smart money and there's dumb money. And it sounds like this is very smart money because, yeah. uh, if they've done it before, <laughs> I, I, I don't want to use the term dumb money. You know, they, they used to call them doctor and dentist <laughs> deals. And I, gotta, I say that lightly because my brother's a doctor, but, um, Definitely. I mean, I think that uh, what might look like a good, what, what like, look like good numbers on the surface, sometimes take a very deep level of expertise and familiarity to know truly whether it's going to scale. And that I think is where, you know, Rocket's such an incredible backer. And really, you know, as an entrepreneur, being given the permission, uh, not even just the permission, really almost the requirement to think big and build yeah. the business in such a way that we are swinging for the fences, you know, rather than just trying to get on base or a bunt, yeah. you know, for a, for a backer like Rocket, a $50 million exit, you know, even if it's, you know, 10x their money is really not going to move the needle. They're looking for a business that can really transform things. And that's kind of, uh, that's where it's been such a great partnership. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I really enjoyed it, like just this, the enti this entire kind of talk that you just had, had because when I started in this industry, I think uh, five, ten years ago, um, to go to somebody and and I'm a big I, I like to read a lot um, and I've read I think it's a zero to one from Peter Thiel. I don't know if you're familiar with that yeah. book, but yeah. uh, right. he t he talks about you can, yeah you can't just be like you know uh, a business that's like doing well. You have to be making sure yeah. that you're making strong moves so you're shaping that market. And, and I, I love that entire kind of mantra um, of you're not like, you know what, growing and having two, three, ten guys underneath you is not something that's good because now your your business is actually more fragile than um, when it was just you. So you have to think at a point where it's kind of operating on its own and it's building on its yeah. own. And it's not just a funnel, it's more of a flywheel. So you're just kind of building momentum on what you've just right. built and you just keep getting bigger. It's more of a snowball effect. So uh, yeah. the amount of conversations where I've had with with individuals within the industry saying oh, no, and, and the conversation is, hey, listen, I don't think we should be aiming for, you know, um, X amount. It has to be X times 100. You can't be yeah. looking at like small numbers. It just feels like within the Canadian market, people are accustomed to just having and there's uh, it's, it's to some it's not there's nothing wrong with it to having a really good business but a good business often enough is not a great business and a great business is just that customer journey what did you have any kind of issues i mean if you've had buying from um, rocket mortgage us do you have kind of any kind of friction within canada as you're kind of getting your envision vision across of like making sure you're across the country making sure you're 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 providing the best service with uh, good, uh, with the cheapest price, um, at, cheapest price for that service, um, and being able to make sure that everybody kind of knows who you are. Was there any kind of pushback um, as to um, that vision and saying, no, maybe, maybe this is not something that uh, you should be looking for? You know, I would actually say that for the most part, the industry has been very supportive. 
Um, there has definitely been, mm. I'll say, maybe more uh, like a healthy degree of skepticism rather than mm. you know a, a pushback. And I and I say that because um, you know it, it is a very competitive space, and you know sometimes I think as Canadians we have to almost uh, be almost apologetic about ambition. You know, you try to yeah. almost couch it in, yeah. in more reasonable terms. And so we, you know, we put out there early some pretty big goals um, and people definitely raised some eyebrows and, um, and we kind of did in a way that was, you know, unabashedly ambitious, not because we are, uh, you know, greedy or really self-centered. In fact, our team is, I think, incredibly humble, but really about having that passion for this business to shoot for something that is big and something we can be really be proud of. So I, I wouldn't say that we've gotten a lot of, you know, resistance or, or pushback. Um, where I think there has been a challenge, I would say, is that, um, you know, I've kind of made the observation that um, the reason I think that Rocket Mortgage previously, or, or the idea of Rocket Mortgage, this idea of push button, get mortgage doesn't mm -hmm. exist in Canada, is not because of a lack of technologists, right? It's not because we don't have the, the talent uh, to go out and, and, and code that service. I, I think it's because the industry is quite fragmented. And that is something mm -hmm. that, I think we observed a lot at Lendesk, which is to say, um, you know, say broadly, you'll have two channels. You'll have a, the broker channel and you'll have the, the bank channel. In the broker channel, you've got mortgage brokers who often are trying to innovate uh, on their business, which might include, you know, lead forms, websites, some kind of online application. You've got the lenders that are working on their individual innovations, broker portals, or their, you know, their CRMs or their uh, or underwriting systems. And you've got Lendesk in the middle and other firms trying to essentially integrate those two. And if all three groups aren't perfectly in tune and, and working together, then you're going to get yeah. these siloed experiences and no amount of, uh, no amount of, uh, incredible front end client experience is going to overcome the pain of having to fax a document or wet sign and mail something or a lender taking three weeks to get back to you with no visibility, you know? So, so I think yeah. that um, I think that in order to really deliver on that vision, you need to have either a deep level of integration across partners or or vertical integration. And if you think about it, um, you know, banks or or credit unions, they're really the only ones that are fully integrated, right? You can walk into a branch or talk to an advisor on the phone. You can you can both talk to them. You can they can underwrite and they can fund. You know, but as we know, those kind of institutions really struggle from an innovation perspective, certainly doing it quickly. Um, I, I kind of mm -hmm. like to point out that I, I think that the U.S. got that idea of taking a photo of and depositing your check something like eight years before it happened in Canada. And I just couldn't understand why I still had to go yeah. to an ATM to, to put in a, a, yeah. a check. So really, it <laughs> happened slowly, maybe for conservatism, maybe for regulatory purposes, or maybe just because of you know execution. So, um, so I think there's an opportunity for us in the non-bank channel to create an opportunity that encompasses that entire journey and as a result, really drive change. Hmm. So moving, changing gears just a little bit, um, I just want to kind of then jump into that phenomenal success that you've experienced with Rocket Mortgage in terms of growth. I mean, to go from a team of four to more than 170 in like not even three years um, and based off of, of volume numbers and all of that that you're posting um, is amazing. So based on all what you just kind of said where, where um, there's that – that siloed experience, is that what you kind of capitalized on to get that success? Or is it partially that, partially something else? I'm trying to get the secret sauce out here. But uh, so what was the kind of recipe to that phenomenal growth? Well, anyway, the thing about secret sauce is it tends to, it tends to stay secret, but I'll, I'll, try to give you, I'll try to give you a sense for the ingredients, maybe not the recipe. Um, so, uh, you know, small correction, I don't think we're quite at 170 people yet. I think maybe we're at 140 or 150, depending on how you count it. Certainly still a okay. big number, but, um, but, um, yeah. you know, I, I think it was, I think it was, it was two things. One is, um, I think our team really focusing on, um, I think proving out our vision in a small scale, gaining mm -hmm. the trust of the board. Um, and our investors to effectively uh, enable us to unlock and fund that next stage. Um, 
Yeah. You know, I, sometimes I tell my team, or I ask them, you know, what, what do you think it is that I do? And, and sometimes I say I'm, I'm, I'm a storyteller in the sense that, you know, being able to paint the vision of what we're trying to do, you know, why it's going to work, why it's worth investing in. And that I think as a team, something we've done really, really well. Starting off small, I think for most of the first year, we were, you know, maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 people, but we had a thesis, we proved it out, we showed it in the data, and that kind of unlocked our next phase of growth. So being able to, I think, get the buy-in of our team, of our partners, yeah. of, our, of our investor to continue to uh, drive that growth. Uh, secondly, you know, one thing that's, again, amazing about partnering uh, with rocket companies uh, is that... Um, is that we were able to tap into their shared services organization, which is called Rocket Central. And so when we think about recruiting, when we think about um, team building, training, all that stuff, we were able to do at a, at, a, at a much bigger level of scale. So rather than thinking about, you know, we got to hire one or two agents, we got to think about how do we build a system that allows us to hire 10 to 15 yeah. agents a month. That is a very different level of thinking. Yeah. And it's something that's something that Rocket Companies and uh, Rocket Mortgage has done, I think, better than anyone in the space. Being able to scale that quickly is very, very difficult. It takes a very different mindset. It's all about processes. It can't just be, you know, so-and-so knows how to do it. It needs to be like, so-and-so figured it out. We documented it. We, we understood it. You know, we train it. And it's a process that continues. So, um, so I think largely it's been those two things. It's been getting the buy-in, getting the trust, figuring out the processes and planning to build for scale be able to execute in that, in that fashion. And then to answer another question within that, which is, you know, is it as a result of having figured out that, that whole journey? And, and I'm going to say, actually, no, not, not yet. Um, you know, as a, as I, you know, we have certainly figured out parts of the journey, but there's a long way to go before that, that full vision is realized. Um, we announced in our uh, rebrand press release that we're going to becoming a lender in the fall. And becoming a lender is key part is a key part of that vision. So we work with a number of lenders today. They've been fantastic partners with us, mm -hmm. um, and we you know, are going to continue to work with them to improve that experience. But just inherently, our ability to drive change um, within our own ecosystem is just going to be much faster. And our hope is that by proving out what's possible there, that we can really uh, convince our other partners to do the same. Ultimately, our, our goal here is to provide the best offering to clients and if that happens to be our offering then yeah. you know then great and if it happens to be not the best offering and our clients want to go with another lender then as a broker we're going to honor that commitment but that is our goal to help really drive yeah. innovation by proving what's possible so one quick question so then when you just said um hopefully convince your other partners are you referring to other lenders to kind of do the same have the same change as you right. kind of create a model for how lending should evolve. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so we're, we're a broker today. We, you know, we work with um, dozens of lenders. Um, but you know, in many ways, I think the evolution of that space has been, in some ways, relatively stagnant for many years. Um, and so, I think everyone has got a similar idea of what would make it better. And I've and I've used this analogy of the you know Domino's Pizza Tracker. A number of time, you know, wouldn't it be great if we had a Domino's Pizza <laughs> Tracker for our mortgage? This highly stressful, uh, you know, process that gets sent off into the into the abyss, and then maybe you get a commitment letter back, yeah. and then it goes back into the abyss. And even when it enters your world, you know, how how great would it be if people could sort of have regular updates? I think everyone agrees that that would be a great idea, but the ability to actually make it happen has been uh, has been stunted for many years. And so, at the end of the day, we've got a ton of talented people in this space. People can figure it out. They just have to commit and see the value of investing to make it happen. And I, and I think that will happen yeah. uh, in the coming years. Yeah, well, definitely. So at a, at a very, um, I guess, high level, what's kind of the customer journey right now for people? If any of my listeners want to go to Rocket Mortgage for a mortgage, um, is it purely digital? Is it, do I give you, do they give you a call? What's kind of the entire process? What's the journey like working with Rocket Mortgage currently? So today we effectively have two different journeys, someone that could follow and, and that that's relatively recent. We started off really focusing on the people side of the journey because it, you know, it, it's mm -hmm. our belief that any, even any digital experience 
uh, still needs to be underpinned with really great service if the client needs it. So if a client you know, is, uh, needs help, we need to be able to provide it to them in whatever format they want and, ha and scaling that and having really amazing service to go with it is key. So that's where we started. We launched our portal uh, a few weeks ago now or a couple months ago. And so clients can start uh, either online, they can create an account, they can fill out their mortgage application. Um, we have a, a smart application that will basically at the end of it ask for a certain set of documents um, related to the information that they filled out in the application. Um, once that information is received, mm -hmm. uh, they'll receive a call from one of our agents. Um, alternatively, they could just call our agents directly and we can help walk them through the process. So that's where that, that dual process okay. exists. Um, and then once the application is complete, um, that's where they, today, where those two journeys converge. So they'll get on the phone with one of our agents. Our goal is to be able to serve clients you know, in less than a minute once they reach out to us. And... Um, and really walk them through the process, you know, dig deep, understand the story, look for opportunities in their credit bureau. I think that's another space where I think many, um, many traditional offerings in the space don't necessarily uh, really dig deep to try to find opportunities for clients. You know, they, they ask what their current mm -hmm. rate is and if they can't offer a better rate, they'll say, sorry, I can't help you. But, um, you know, I think there's a tremendous opportunity to help people with this major financial decision. And so, our team really works with the client to understand their goals and their needs and find a solution that fits. Um, once we once we um, complete their application, we're going to offer them, uh, you know, a, a product from one of our lenders that we think best suits their needs. If the client agrees to proceed, we'll submit that today to one of our lender partners, and um, and then in due course, we'll work through, you know, if the commitment is received, we'll work through the process of satisfying the conditions and eventually close the loan. Um, mm -hmm. our goal in time is to essentially move more of that experience to give a digital option, you know, always clients having the choice, whether they prefer to go, um, work directly with an agent or, or do something self-serve, but in either case, being able to move between the two seamlessly, I think is a key part of making this work, uh, you know, because it's daunting taking on, uh, a potentially very large debt, you know, especially in Canada where it's becoming increase, increasingly complex understanding yeah. the different types of income, how they qualify, the qualifying rates, um, all these sort of nuances of our system are, you know, are increasingly complex. And so the goal is to really provide clients the best service and the best journey uh, in, in whatever format they prefer. Yeah, so you're giving them a, a few options. I mean, the uh, you know better than I do, but uh, within Canada, the a mortgage is no longer just a mortgage. You've just got so many different options, and to be able to kind of give people the opportunity to digest that information, it's not, it's it's difficult. It's because it, you're on on one hand you're balancing giving the information to the client, but on the other hand, you do want them to have a digital experience where they get the time to kind of understand what they're doing and go through their options and figure all of that yeah. out themselves. Yeah. Um, so switching to some market questions, um, sure. and, and, uh, market questions, and, and this is going to be an inter interesting conversation because I'm assuming rightfully so, um, with your associ association with rocket mortgage in the U S you've kind of got a good understanding of the U S market in terms of mortgages, interest rates, what the fed's doing over there. And we've got the bank of Canada here. Everybody's kind of like every other day you've got like a, a, a new, uh, a headline that's kind of saying the sky is falling. Everything is crashing and burning. Um, maybe it's because Canadians are used to like 1.4% uh, interest rates and we're going back to more of a normal rate, but, um, things are changing, things are changing. And I want to know your opinion. Where do you see, cause I know that we're getting hikes. Um, there's a fear of recession, um, and our interest rates are kind of, I would argue more tied to the U S naturally, just because, um, if we, if we, if we don't, if we step out of sync, it affects our, con our currency conversion, which can affect our exports. So it's, it's not like a simple kind of, Hey, um, inflation is getting too high. So we're just going to hike interest rates. We also kind of look at our neighbor down yeah. South to see what they're doing and kind of see if we can coordinate. So given that kind of nuance, um, this is a crystal ball question. So where, where do you see, um, the mortgage market <laughs> in a year? And don't worry, I'm not going to hold you to it, but I'd, yeah. I'd love to have your kind of take on where, where you think the Canadian market's going. 
you know, if, if in post editing you can add like a disclaimer at the bottom, this is not, you know, this is this is not uh, this is not to be relied upon. Um, and I say that jokingly because you know I've been watching market for, for a long time, but this has got to be one of the greatest periods of uncertainty that I've ever seen. Um, you know, I think probably we both. Mm. You said you did a lot of reading. Uh, certainly, I do as well. And it's amazing to see these, you know, these. Um, participants in the markets, whether it be, you know, economists or hedge fund managers or investors of any kind, bank, you know, bank CEOs, um, very, very smart people, incredibly convincing arguments on exactly both sides of the equation. Some people say inflation's here to say, mm -hmm. some people say inflation's, you know, going to trend back downwards and it's, you know, it's transitory, obviously the central banks being the one is a great example. So I will caveat that by saying, you know, probably more than any other time is where I've seen the most the greatest degree of bifurcation in terms of the people's views of the market. And so um, it's a very challenging time, I think, to make those forecasts. And I think that as a result of that, um, in some ways it's best to operate under the assumption of uncertainty. So rather than, you know, uh, pick a pick an outcome and go all in on that, I think maybe, maybe we'll have a view, but really um, operate knowing that that view you know, might very well need to change depending on mm -hmm. how things go. So, so that I'll say is, is the caveat of the backdrop um, of, the, mm -hmm. of the current environment that we're in. If you're asking my own per current view, um, and I would say this is really not the view of, you know, rocket companies broadly, but it does seem to be that inflation is likely to be a bit more persistent, certainly than the central banks uh, thought it was going to be a year ago. I think that much has been proven true. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're just seeing... Certainly uh, in the labor market, uh, you know, persistently low unemployment, persistently high uh, job numbers of job openings. And we're starting to see that work through, I think, in the way that wages are moving. Um, you know, I think energy is slowed down a little bit, but in many ways, rents are now rising. So we're seeing the, you know, what segment of the economy is carrying the baton of inflation uh, changing a little bit. So, um, yeah. You know, but all but all this all this time, interest rates are rising. So, um, and I would I would agree with you that Canada and the U.S. tend to move closely, um, but I think this time around, um, Canada's got a slightly different uh, in a slightly different spot than the U.S. Just given the reliance of the economy on housing, I think that Canada almost mm. feels like it could feel the impact of higher rates maybe sooner or to a greater extent than the U.S. Again, the U.S. has a 30-year mortgage rate or a 30-year mortgage term. That probably means a greater share of people have rates that are locked in for longer. Uh, Canada's got five-year mm -hmm. terms, even on a fixed basis. And so depending on how long we stay in this heightened environment, people are going to likely reset their rates to higher rates sooner than they would in the U.S. So I think those two things might affect the economy differently. Um, and I think that the key thing for us to all watch is, you know, where the housing market or no, sorry, where the, where the job market goes. I think to the extent that we maintain a relatively yeah. robust job market, then I think that we'll probably see some turbulence in housing prices, but ultimately people will still be uh, employed. There'll be a lot of activity and, you know, housing will stabilize and people will keep sort of, you know, adjust to the new higher prices and move on. I think in both in Canada and the U S um, I think that where employment goes is probably the key, the biggest unknown. Yeah, no, and I, I feel like uh, a lot of people do try to kind of say it's the Canadian market is the same as the States because they're seeing some similarities, but I, I just feel like yeah. all the arguments, all the reasons that you kind of get, gave are reasons to why um, I guess the Fed officially is not saying that the U.S. is in a recession because they've got a strong labor market. We've got a strong labor, labor market in Canada, um, but it's also... Um, in the Canadian market, I don't think we have a shortage. Uh, I mean, we do have a shortage, I would argue, of supply of houses. We don't have a shortage of jobs. And, and my kind of feeling, just to add to what you're saying, is that this little pause that we have in terms of real estate activity is more people trying to figure out where things are headed as opposed to yeah. um, just like there's nobody can afford a house. I think people still can afford a house. Yeah. There's a lot of people kind of waiting on the sideline and yeah. they're just trying to jump yeah. in. They're just trying to see where things are headed. Yeah. Agreed. And I, I think there's like two big wild cards for Canada as well. It's just the, our, our rate of relative immigration is by far the highest in the G7 it really yeah. is tremendous. The number of new talented 
uh, educated people that are coming to this country every year that obviously has a big impact. And then of course there's you know, commodities um, which tend to do reasonably well in relation to varying environments. So it's um, the, you know, I, I hopefully, well, I know you didn't pay anything for this crystal ball because it's quite murky. So, but I would continue to encourage you not to, <laughs> not to, not to pay too much for this particular crystal ball. Yeah. No, you know what? Um, thank you. Thank you for coming on. I, we've, I got some, we got some great advice. I hope my listeners can really take advantage of it. Um, depending on where they're listening, if they want to reach out to Rocket Mortgage for the next, next mortgage, I'm going to have the contact information either below or on the side. Any, any, any last words, Hashima, before we sign off? Yeah, probably, you know, the biggest thing I'll say is to also, you know, not people just looking for a mortgage, but looking for a career. Um, we are constantly looking for talented people. Uh, our team is growing all the time, both in the mortgage specific space, but also in the technology space, uh, finance, uh, you know, strategy, so many areas, uh, always interested in hearing from talented people, which I'm sure that, you know, your listeners are, are, uh, have sort of a ton of talent within them. So also encourage people to reach out for that, for that reason as well. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. No problem. It was a pleasure. Thanks for having me.